نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما فلما سلوا وسلم بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وسهله دائما أبدا سلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله Continuing with the subject of Imam Hussain al-Islam and Karbala you know in last week basically we just kind of gave it or reiterated uh, his position and status and we started talking about Kufa. And as I said, Kufa is a town or a city, which basically was a military city, set up during the Khilafah of Umar, radiallahu anhu. Uh, and the first governor of Kufa was Abdullah ibn Masood, radiallahu anhu, who is amongst the companions number two as far as the knowledge of fiqh. Second to Sayyidina Ali, karamallahu wajh. And so, you know, there was a lot of knowledge within the city. But knowledge by itself has no meaning. Of course, Ali Radi also came to Kufa when he transferred the capital from Medina Munawara to Kufa during his Khilafah in order to get the rebels out of Medina Munawara, out of the city of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so, also, you know, you can imagine the knowledge of Ali who is the door to the city of knowledge, who is the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you have all of this knowledge, but if you look at the nature of the people of Kufa, it was rather treacherous. And this will, you know, we'll come back to this point as well, but they, they are the people who betrayed Ali, these are the same people who betrayed the son of Ali, Imam Hassan, alayhi wa sallam. You know, when, uh, after the Battle of Safin, and it's very interesting because if you look at this, you know, after the Battle of Safin, from the army of Ali, then you have twenty thousand people who desert because they did because uh, they didn't agree with the decision. And it wasn't that they didn't agree with the decision; it was they didn't agree with Ali or uh, accepting arbitration. And because of this, they said, "Oh, he has become kafir." And as we mentioned before, 11,000 of them, they go back and they say, okay, we're not against Ali, nor are we with him. Which you know, basically means, okay, you have nothing. You know, at least take a stand. 4,000 said, oh yes, you know, we understand our mistake and we're coming back to Ali. 5,000 said, no, we're going to fight against him. And Rasulullah saw some hadith are in Sayyid Muslim as well as other books of hadith where Rasulullah describes the people, describes their leaders. And one of the description of the leader in this battle, which is the Battle of Nahran, where he fought against five thousand people, all of whom are Hafiz of Quran, all of whom are scholars of the time. In fact, their leader was one of the students of Ali. You know, the description that Rasulullah gave of him that his arms will be defective, short. The skin on the arms will be very, uh, kind of like, uh, well, for those who understand vitiligo, just uh, uh, decolored. And the ends will be, you know, the skin will be soft like a nipple. In complete description, Rasulullah gives him. This man studied under Ali. You know, this was a man who no one 
liked in the community and was despised and, and so Ali Radha, he used to eat from the from the table of Ali. So Ali Radha is the one who who supported this man, taught this man, and then he is the one who comes against him and says, Oh, you become God. And this isn't something uncommon. This is something relatively common. Where you see many people who, you know, in, in general knowledge, we, it's known as sophomoreish knowledge. You know, like people that start college and they get to, you know, second year, which is sophomore, and now they think, oh, I know something. And they start thinking, oh, I know more than the teacher knows. Of course, Google has made everybody experts on everything these days. No, just Google it. You know, and I know more than the guy who's been studying this for 30 years. And if you also look, you know, where Rasulullah Sallam says, in the Sahih Hadith, where he says that, you know, the Jews will be split up into 71 groups and the, uh, or, or ideologies, and the Christians into 72, and my Ummah, the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallam, will be split up into 73 of which he said only one will go to Jannah. If you look at all of these, and all of these ideologies had formed by the end of the Khilafah of Sayyidina Ali, Karamallah. Because along with knowing the groups, you also have to know how to deal with the groups. And so Ali Radun is the one who gave us that lesson. Of course, most people don't know the Khilafah of Ali, so they don't know the lesson. The names have changed, but if you look at the ideologies and the methodologies as to how they arrive at their, their uh, decision-making process, it's all the same. And none of these groups were formed by someone who you would look, consider from a worldly standpoint as being ignorant. These are all well-educated people. But education has no meaning unless the heart is in the right place. You know, and this is why Rasulullah he said, you know, about the Khawarij, he said that, you know, that they will recite the Quran. And he said, saying this to Ali and Khalid bin Walid and, and Umar, radiallahu anhu, that, you know, you will be ashamed of your recitation. Their tajweed and pronunciation and, and the way they recite and their voices will be so nice that you, you know, and Umar is the son of Khattab. You know, Khattab, of course, he died as a, as a kafir, but his, he was Khattab because he was such a good khatib. He was such an eloquent speaker. Dhaad, which is the hardest letter in Arabic to pronounce, even for the Arabs. Most Arabs pronounce it from the left side. Umar Radin was one of the few who could pronounce it equally well from both sides. <coughs> and the Rasulullah is saying to him that you will be ashamed of your recitation when you hear these people. Yet there will be nothing below their collarbones. It's all up here. Nothing here. Nothing in the heart. <coughs> and this also again gets to the point where Rasulullah said, you know, that there is a, a flesh, a piece of flesh in the body. That if that is good, then everything is good. And if that is bad, everything is bad. And that piece of flesh is the heart. This is the center of love. And Iman is nothing but love of Allah and His Messenger. That is Iman. And none of the actions have any meaning unless there is Iman behind that. Unless the foundation of Iman is solid, then nothing built up on top of that has any meaning. Not salat, zakat, hajj, fasting, jihad, nothing. And this is part of the lesson that we get from Karbala. And we get from the life of Sayyidina Ali. Radiallahu. So this man who ate from the table spread of Ali who studied under Ali is the one who now he comes against him with this army and says, oh, Ali has become God. 
again, this is nothing old and it's nothing new. And this is something that's continuing even today. You know, we, we, we take from the bounties of our Lord and then we still rebel against Him. You know, governmental levels and individual levels. You know, it's easy for us to say, oh, you know, this government and this and that. But even you look at the individuals. The governments are there because of the individuals. The decisions that are being made in the Gulf states and in Saudi Arabia could not have been made if everyone there was pious. If you look at the methodology and the ideology that they use, this is the same as the Khawarij during the time of Ali and the Mu'tazila. You know, Mu'tazila was a, was a branch of the Khawarij. Which everyone verbally acknowledges, oh, these are deep, that the Mu'tazila are deviants. Even the modern day Wahhabis and Salafis say that the Mu'tazila, they were deviants. Yet the ideology and the methodology they use is the exact same uh, arguments. You know, during the time of uh, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, alhamdulillah, you know, when Ma Ma'moon Rashid, who was the king from Banu Abbas, and he made Mu'tazila the state religion. You know, like in Saudi Arabia, Wahhabism is the state religion. So he made Mu'tazila the state religion, and, and you know, if you didn't accept their ideology as a scholar, then you would be punished or killed. And this is why Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, you know, they would whip him and then throw him on the burning, on, on, on the salty shore. On it with his chin. To the extent that at one point he thought about giving up his fight and, and a thief was walking by. Because every time after Salat, after this incident, after each Salat, he would make dua for that thief. And so his son asked him, he said, why do you make dua for this, you know, this man? Who is this man? He said, he was a thief. He is a thief. But he taught me a lesson. He said, one day when they, they whipped me and they threw me on, on the shore, you know, on the salt, you know, that salt getting into those wounds, and... You know, and I was moaning, and, and he came by, and I, I said to him that I was thinking of, you know, giving up. He says, how can you give up? He says, I am a thief. And he showed me his back, and it had more scars on his back than my back. He says, I am a thief, and I never give up my profession. How can you be a soldier for the cause of Allah and his messenger? Salah, and even contemplate giving up your, 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 your mission. He says, that gave me the strength to continue on. But the argument was what? They said that the Qur'an is the khalq, it is a creation. Yet, we know Qur'an is kalam Allah, is the word of Allah. And you cannot separate the word from the one whose word it is. So the Qur'an is not creation. So what do they say? The argument they used was that every shay, the hadith where every shay is the creation of Allah. Allahu khaliqu kulla shay. Verse of Qur'an. Allahu khaliqu kulla shay. Allah is the creator of every shay, everything. And the Rasulullah Sussam referred to the Quran as Shay, as a thing. So therefore, so if Allah is the creator of Kullu, everything, every Shay, and the Quran is Shay, then the Quran is creation. And this is where Abdul Aziz Makki Rahmatullah, when he debated with them, because Imam Ahmad al Hanbal was in jail, he debated with them, and what did he say? And the, and the final argument was what? Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran, Kullu nafsin dhaikatul maut. Every nafs will taste death. And yet Allah subhanahu wa also in the Quran, He says, Kataba ala nafsihi rahmah. 
Allah says about himself that I have written upon my nafs rahmah mercy so if every nafs will taste that and Allah refers to himself as nafs then by according to your meaning of kullu then Allah will also taste death that's the problem so that ended the debate but the interesting thing was that at that moment the king Mu'tasim Billah who was the king at that time he acknowledged oh yes I believe this but then afterwards he went back to the same old ideology you know, it was the same thing when you're dealing with the Wahhabis and you say, okay, this, 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 and this, and they can't argue with you at all. But then in the end, you know, it's like talking with Christians. You know, you say, you talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about Rasulullah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they can't dis dispute anything. What do they say? But, but I still believe. And the same thing. You know, you've laid out the argument and they have no, nothing to counter the argument. Uh, but I still, they say, well, those scholars, how, how can those scholars be wrong? How can the students of Imam of Sayyidina Ali and Imam Hassan Basri be wrong? The people that started the Mu'tazila, these were students of Imam Hassan Basri, who was the Khalifa of Ali. Ali had four Khulafa, his two sons, Kumail bin Ziyad and Imam Hassan Basri. So the people that, the two scholars that started the Mu'tazila, the deviant movement, these are students of Imam Hassan Basri. There was no shortage of knowledge. But what was lacking was, was the true, true love of Allah and His Messenger. That's complete submission. Not that, well, I like this. You know, it's like, like I was saying, their arguments, the ideology is the same because when they when they define bid'a, you know, the, the Wahhabis when they define bid'a, they use the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Kullu bid'atin dalala, kullu dalalatin finnaat. Again, here it says kullu. I say every bid'a is misguidance, and every misguidance is in the fire. So they say, by this definition, they say, oh, there is no such thing as bid'a hasan which means a good, good, good innovation. And yet Umar Radio, when he established Tarawi in Jama'ah, in congregation, what did he say? He said, Bida Hasana. So then the argument is, oh, he was using it linguistically, whatever that means. Because, you know, they can't acknowledge themselves, well, maybe my thought process isn't right. But your thought process is the same as the Mu'tazila during the time, you know, who everyone, even your group says, oh, these were deviants. But you're using the same methodology as far as coming to conclusions. So this is Kufa. A lot of knowledge, no sincerity. And some of these are also the sons of various Sahabi. <coughs> Companions of Rasulullah, Ridwanullah <laughs> Ajma'in. You know, Allah is pleased with them all. But just like the son of Nuh alayhi salam, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when Nuh, Nuh alayhi salam says, Oh Allah, my son. And Allah says, He's not your son. Because his actions are not in line with you. So just because someone is the son of a Sahabi, unless his actions are in line with the Sahabi, doesn't mean anything. The one who will raise up Imam Hussein al-Islam's head on his spear is the son of who? It's the son of Anas bin Malik. But again, his actions are not in line with his father's actions or <coughs> You know, the Shia, they try to use this against the Sahabi. They say, oh, see, who killed Imam Hussein al-Islam? You know, Amr bin Sa'ad. He's the son of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas. You know, 
know, he's one of the generals that main generals in this battle against Imam Hussein al -Sain. But again, his actions are not in line with his father's. And if you read the hadith which are in Sahih Muslim, his father disowned him. They forgot to mention that part of it. Because again, they have to push their agenda. So when Imam Hussein al-Islam has made up, you know, the letter from Muslim bin Aqib, his cousin, comes and he says, everything is good here. You know, the people are ready to accept you. Come. So he starts gathering his family to go. Multiple companions, including Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Jafar, and various other companions come to him. And what do they say? They say, please don't go. And this is also what some people these days, they try to use. They say, oh, see, Imam al Islam, if what he was doing was right, then why would the companions try to stop him? They don't tell you why they were trying to stop him or the, or, or the uh, statement after that. They said, please don't go because you know the people of Kufa will betray you. It wasn't that don't go because you're doing something wrong, that this is not the right step to take. All of them said don't go because you know what they did to your father. You know what they did to your, your brother. We don't expect any good from them. They will betray you. Please don't go. And Imam Hussein al-Islam's response to them was what? That I have to go to fulfill the promise I have made my grandfather. To safeguard Islam. To give, breathe life back into Islam. Because what was being left of Islam was the ritual practices without the heart. Yeah, everybody's making salat and everybody's making keeping fast and, and doing all of these things. But the true sacrifice that comes from the heart is, no, is non-existent. The love of Allah and His messengers, and what that demands from us. You know, because Iman is the love of Allah and His messenger. And what did He say? What did Rasulullah say to Omar? When he asked Omar, how much do you love me? He said, I love you more than everything else except my own life. And he said, your iman is not complete. So then now Umar, he digs deep. He's looking, looking inside himself and realizing that by himself he is nothing. The only reason he is anything is because of Rasulullah. So he says, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than everything in the world, including myself. And he says, Al-An, now. And Bukhari, you know, where Rasulullah says, says that none of you is a believer unless he loves me more than he loves his, his forefathers, his offspring, his progeny, and all of mankind combined. You know, if somebody comes to me, and this is common these days, you know, he says, he doesn't have to say anything major. Oh, you know, what are you doing? He didn't even talk to me straight. He didn't have to even say anything. It's like, oh, he didn't even look at me right. Why are you looking at me like this? And you're upset. Don't even talk to the guy. I come up to somebody and say, oh, you know, your father, he didn't know anything. He didn't have any knowledge. He throw me out of his house. Say, so, oh, you know, you... You don't have any authority over anything. The guy won't talk to me for, for, you know, for the rest of my life. And yet there are so-called scholars that write this about Rasulullah. Try to equate his knowledge to the knowledge of anybody else. Try to equate his, say that he didn't even have the authority to break a twig in two. These are things that are written. So-called scholars that say that my staff 
benefits me more than the rawda of Rasulullah so some, because with my staff I can break the limbs of the of the trees to feed my goats. And then when you point this out, they say, oh, he's a scholar. That's the... You know, if I said that same wording about your mother or your father or even yourself, you'd want to kill me. And now when it's being said about Rasulullah so nice. you know. Worse than what the French do or the Danish have done. At least they say that they don't believe in him. At least we know that they are kafir. These guys are reciting the kalma of Rasulullah And then they want to write stuff like this and say stuff like this. And it's fine, okay, they say, say stuff like that, but then I should react to that. You know, the, the, the Kufar, when they say stuff like that, everybody's up in arms. And this is double standard, hypocrisy. And then we want to know why our condition is like it is. Someone in authority, you know, if I commit a crime against somebody who has authority, he may forgive me. But if I commit a crime against that one's beloved, there is no forgiveness. You know, if I insult you, you may forgive me. But if I insult the one that you love, Because then if you forgive me, now my question is, what type of love is this? Allah hides the faults of everyone. He is a sattar That's one of his names. It's the one who hides the faults. To the extent that on the day of judgment, everyone will be called by the names of their mother. You know, here we're the... Uh, so-and-so the son of the father on the day of judgment the angels when they call the names they'll say so-and-so the son of the mother why because who he refers to as his father in this world may not really have been his father only the mother knows that yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mercy To hide the faults, he will not disclose that openly. Yet when it comes to the honor of Rasulullah, when Walid bin Mughayra, he insults Rasulullah by saying that he is a magician. And I won't go into the whole story because there's time, time is short. Yet when he does this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals Noon wal Qalam. And in that surah, He curses him ten times. <coughs> and in the end, He says the name <coughs> about Walid bin Mughayrah. Zanim means one born from zina, one born from adultery. So when it comes to the honor of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah is willing to forgo being sattar. <coughs> you read the Quran, it's all in there. And the honor of Imam Hussein Alaihi Wasallam is the honor of Rasulullah <coughs> And so for those who say, oh, we won't be asked about this on the Day of Judgment. What world are we living in? <coughs> we will be asked about this in the grave when we are shown the Rasulullah And the question isn't, who is your prophet? If you read the books of Hadith, Ma kuntu taqulu fi haqqi hadha rajal. 
You know, for Allah, Allah says, Ma uh, who is your Lord? Nothing specific there. Just who is your Lord? He says, Rabbi Allah. He doesn't ask, how did I believe in Allah? Simply, who is Allah? Who is your Lord? Rabbi Allah. Ma deenuka. What was your deen? Again, doesn't specify that did you really practice this or not? But when it comes to Rasulullah Sallallahu what in truth did you say about this man? It's specific. Time's up. Allah help us understand, inshallah. Uh, you know, things are going slow, but there's so much to cover. Because all of Islam is contained within Karbala. It is all there. It's only a matter of looking at it. So may Allah SWT allow us to understand. And may He fill our hearts with His true love and the true love of His beloved Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His family, His companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made